Okay, so um, our fourth class, but our third chapter, that always amuses me to think that we can't keep our numbers straight, but that's just because we had some background information with the introduction. Um, this is uh, the fourth class, third chapter, and the second statement of faith. So we have even yet another number to throw in there. Last week, um, talking about uh, God the Father. So the Apostles' Creed is brief. It's short. Um, the Nicene Creed adds further detail. It adds further context. You can kind of see the historical response to the smart Alex saying, what does that mean? That even the first clause, I believe in God the Father, Almighty Creator of heaven and earth, is longer in the Nicene Creed than it is in the Apostles' Creed. So we're in the second um, the second set of creedal affirmations I believe in. And so the creed reflects the Trinity. I believe in God the Father. I believe in God the Son is the second. And I believe in God the Holy Spirit is the third. We're in the second one, but this one's longer. I'm going to share my screen for a second. Come on, screen share. There we go. All right. So in sharing the screen, hopefully you guys can see this. I have it blown up pretty big. Um, this is now in the second, I wouldn't call it a clause because there's multiple clauses in here, but it's the second statement of faith, the second affirmation, the second person of Trinity. And look how much longer it is. Yes. Yeah. We've gone from one sentence to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sentences. And some of those sentences are rather long with multiple clauses in a single sentence. So um, we will also then take, if you noticed, uh, which I'm assuming you did because we've already read this chapter now, um, we're gonna take this second affirmation in the in the second person of trinity and break it into multiple chapters because it's so long and it's so detailed we're only going to take it kind of a sub statement at a time so today um dr mcgrath has described chapter three <clears throat> has described chapter three as um his mm -hmm. identity and birth Right. So uh, that being said, that is going to take us then through the first two sentences of this primary statement. So what we are going to be um, is really just from I believe in Jesus Christ and to finishing born of the Virgin Mary. Um, Two sentences, one chapter, and then we'll we'll move to the rest of the book as it uh, as it comes up, as it comes across. But that is, you know, why we're slowing down. It seems, or why we're breaking it into further pieces, because there's so much that needs to be said. So my opening question would be, why? Why is there so much more in the section on Jesus than there is on God the Father Almighty? And frankly, I believe the Holy Spirit only is only kind of long because you start throwing the church in there. Why is the section on Jesus so much longer than the other two? Because it's the heart of the Christian faith. The heart of the Christian faith. What else? And because he appeared in the human form where God is there is, spirit. There is so much evidence. Uh, more so than evidence about about God, the Father. Right? So the fact that he appears in human form, the fact there's a lot of evidence, yet there's a lot of ground to cover. Um, absolutely, all these things. Anything else? Everybody's right so far. We deserve an explanation. Deserve an explanation, kind of, and that's kind of really what Tom says. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, McGrath even uses that evidence that just, that, that demands a, a, an explanation. With, with it all laid out, you kind of have to take stock of that and, and really we're all we're all the 
surrounding the, the correctness of this, that without Jesus, his birth, death, and resurrection, this creed is unnecessary completely. He is the heart of it, his very identity, but that identity comes from something, comes from somewhere. We read about the scriptural account, and now we have to make sense of it. And he even covers some erroneous conclusions. He covers erroneous conclusions because, again, this is the work of the smart aleck. Jesus is Lord. Well, what does that mean? Okay, well, now we have to talk about Jesus. Well, which Jesus? Well, Jesus Christ. Well, what does that mean? Well, Jesus Christ is Lord. Well, what does Lord mean? You know, on and on and on. If it weren't for this man, this creed would, would be completely unnecessary. There would be no Christian faith. There would be no need to debate the ins and outs of it. And this is related to something that we kind of talked about in the initial class about historical context and understanding. Shema Yisrael, hero Israel, the Lord your God is one. That is the fundamental, and by fundamental, I mean both groundwork and the first thing said prior to the Ten Commandments. The oneness of God is so ingrained within everything that the Hebrew mind understands about God, uh, in every way that God reveals himself to Israel, that the only reason there's so much to say about Jesus is now we have to figure out what it means for God to be one, but for this man, Jesus, to make claims and to show evidence that he himself should receive the honor and adoration, that he himself has the power, has the ability. Is this two gods now? Is this president God and vice president God, varsity God and junior varsity God? Is this polytheism? Making sense of who Jesus is, is at the heart of the creeds. For that is the evidence that demands a verdict, the very personhood of Jesus. So that's why it's longer, and that's why there's more to cover, and that's why there's more detail that is argued over or has to be interpreted or has to be understood. So let's, let's jump in. Um, the reminder that came up last week when we actually started getting into the words, the specific words of Creed itself, Every word carries freight. That's the statement that a, a seminary professor told me, and I think that's a pretty good way to, to, to construe it. Every single word was argued over. Every single word was prayed over. Every single word had the, those leaders of the universal church under the power of the Holy Spirit formulating together into its final version. There is not a single superfluous, extraneous, or accidental word in there at all. Now, if you want to argue with it, you can argue with it, but you can't say it was, oh, that, that one doesn't mean anything, or that one kind of slipped in on accident. No. And you'll see when we go through this that even the these and a's and ands and ours, little tiny articles or prepositions or um, uh, pronouns, everything makes a point. And that point, we're going to try to understand. All right. So uh, in starting off every one of these clauses, uh, again, believe, credo from the Latin. What are some words we can use to substitute? Affirm. I trust. <laughs> Say those again. They happen at the same time. I affirm. What else? I trust. Trust. Obedience. Obedience. I obey. I count on. I depend on. I rely on. I know all these things. So I <laughs> count on Jesus Christ as only Son, our Lord. I affirm Jesus Christ is only Son our Lord. I obey Jesus Christ is only Son our Lord. So remember that little, little exercise, say the creeds and substitute those other words in, not because one is right and one is wrong, but because all of them can be contained 
in the one word believe, and sometimes it's helpful to remember how big that word is. All right. So we've already talked about belief. What's the very next thing that we say? I believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Every word makes a difference. And this is one of those times where it definitely bears repeating that Christ is not his last name. If Jesus were to fill out a name tag, it would not say Mr. Christ. <laughs> I swear you can grab people off the street mm -hmm. and they will promise you that his last name was Christ. Right. I get it because that's how English works, but that's not how Hebrew works. And that's not how the New Testament works. So Christ, rather than a last name, a surname, how is it better understood? Jesus, the Christ. The Christ, okay. He comes as the Greek word for Messiah. Messiah. So Messiah is, Messiah is Hebrew, Messiah is Hebrew, and Christos, Christ, is Greek. Greek. And so the two languages that the Bible is written in, there is a third Aramaic, but it's just little bits and pieces, phrases and words. For all intents and purposes, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, the New Testament is written in Greek, and the exact same word translated in either one is Messiah, Messiah or Christos, Messiah or Christ. We know this because um, during the during the days of the New Testament, so that first century period, the century before that, uh, we have no existing copies of of Hebrew scriptures from then. That's not to say they didn't exist; they clearly did. But the Hebrew copies that we that, that still are you know, fragments and pieces come from the third century and beyond. So. Even in the time of Christ, they didn't necessarily have the Old Testament written in Hebrew. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. Maybe it was in some places, but not in others. They were reading the Hebrew, a lot of them, in Greek. I mean, they're reading the, the, the Old Testament in Greek. The Septuagint, they would refer to it, which happens... You know, a couple hundred years before Jesus is born, the story is uh, Septuagint means the 70, uh, 70 scholars for 70 days wrote 70 copies and all the copies were identical. And that was proof that the Holy Spirit had inspired them to translate it properly. It's just to say that when even in a, in a, in a, in a synagogue of the, of the, of like an ancient time synagogue, when they would read, they might have been reading in a Greek translation. And whenever they hit the Hebrew word Messiah, they would have seen Christos, even then. So that's just to kind of wrap that, 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 that those words together. Uh, it, would, it would most properly be understood as a title. Or like we said about God, the name God even capital G is not a name per se. What did I say it was last week? A title, job description. The job description. Remember the, the story from my uh, history professor uh, coming home? Hey, breadwinner from his kids. Like, no, no, no. Breadwinner is what I do, yeah. but that's not my name. Uh, my name to them is is daddy or father or dad or whatever. So God, capital G, is a job description. Whoever it is that made all things seen and unseen and sustains us even now and all that kind of stuff, that's God. But that's the job. The name, we could argue, is the tetragrammaton, yod heh vav -Hey. I am who I am, and all the stuff that's wrapped up into that. Or father, who he reveals himself to be. Christ is a job description. Whoever is the son of man, the son of God, the restored king of the Davidic line, is the anointed one of God, is the chosen one of God, so on and so forth. That's the Messiah. And it is, it, it's worth noting, there were plenty of people who claimed that title. Lots and lots. There were people around the time of Jesus 
who were claiming that title. Scripture itself, the New Testament, tries to put that title or reports people trying to put that, uh, that title on who? Remember? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. They start saying, well, you must be the Messiah. Yeah. And he's like, no, I am the one who is calling out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. The one, there's one coming after me. I am not worthy to untie his But the way that John acted, the way that John preached, the way that the crowds uh, responded, the way the power of God was manifest, they're like, you are fulfilling the job description. It must be you. But he can say, nope, there's more to the job than what you see. Even if he, even I'm doing a little bit of it, that doesn't mean that that's actually my job. Just because there's some overlap, the preaching and the teaching and the baptizing and the, all that kind of stuff, the job description of Messiah is that and more. And then more part I don't fulfill. Someone else will. Uh, so during this period of time and before, there were all sorts of folks who were like, I'm the Messiah. Um, generally speaking, um, if you know anything about um, ancient or Jewish history at this point, what were those messiahs doing or claiming? And it, uh, it's just one of the, you either, you've come across this or you haven't, it's no big deal. Generally speaking, they were, um, these were political arguments. Follow me and I will overthrow the Romans and reestablish the kingdom of Israel. Follow me and we will build an army. Follow me and we will fight them off. We will take back what's ours. So for the most part, most of these competing Messiah claims were associated with a portion of the Messianic prophecy. And that portion of the Messianic prophecy was the restoration of the Davidic kingdom. So the Old Testament makes more than one prophecy that upon David's throne, that kind of thing. So if you are a conquered people, living under an empire that you don't like, you don't care for, and they're weird and they're wrong and they are pagans and they want you to, to do stuff that you think is immoral. Well, when you fight, if you want to fight them off, what better way to focus that fight than to say, this is God's plan being fulfilled. And I who want, who will lead you in fighting God has chosen me to do that. All right. So then how do you know? If you got four people. I, I, I have in mind uh, this, this vision all of a sudden of like a uh, police lineup. <laughs> Can you pick out the Messiah? Uh, number two, turn to the left. Um, how did they, how do you figure out, if you got three people saying I'm the Messiah, how do you figure out who it was? Well, I'd say by the way they live, um, the example they set to others. I mean, that's why I think John was so poignant that they thought he was the Messiah because I mean, nobody lived like that. Right. He gave up everything. So. Anything else? You'd have to go back into scriptures about what, particularly in the Old Testament, the prophet said about what the Messiah would be and do. Yes. And, and like John, it, it, not just part of it, but all of it. Plenty of people can fulfill part of it. Or it could at least try. So the operative phrase, and I will try to use it correctly because we pretty much never use it correctly anymore. We say it halfway and everybody knows what we mean. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. That's the full phrase. It's not the proof is in the pudding as though... <laughs> If you dug through the pudding, you would find a clue underneath some, somewhere. Um, because first of all, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a saying derived from the English understanding of pudding, which just means dessert, most likely like a, like a baked pudding or whatever. Um, Yorkshire. Um, the proof of the pudding is in the eating means it looks good, 
but, but the only way to find out if it is good is to taste it. Taste it. Have you ever seen a dish that looks delicious and until you it. taste it? <laughs> so the outward appearance is not enough. The true demonstration is found inside in its essence. To judge who is the Messiah, you have to look at the fulfillment of all of those prophecies and not just from the outside, but you must taste and see that the Lord is good. The proof of the pudding is in the eating, consuming all of it. And then it's not just what the human eye can see or assume. Just like David himself, whose throne is in question, was not the one that Samuel would have anointed. Samuel the prophet is sent by God to the sons of Jesse, one of them is my anointed chosen king. Well, it must be him. He, he's got the look, baby. <laughs> nope. Okay, well, then in him. Nope. Yeah. Then him, then him, then him. They go all the way through the line before it turns out. They didn't even invite David to the party. He was still out working in the fields, but that's the one that the Lord had chosen. Once he's brought in, Samuel can see that. It confirmed what the choice is. But the proof of the pudding is in the eating, not just in the appearance. The eating is going to be encountering Jesus face to face, seeing his entire life. It's the birth, it's the death, it's the resurrection, it's the total package. To taste and see the Lord as good as to consume him, take him inside of us, almost sacramentally. And that's how you know. It's not just somebody who has the look. It's not just somebody who says, hey, follow me. And their, their revolt goes nowhere. It's to see who goes all the way. So one of the things that, um, uh, one of the things that um, uh, Dr. McGrath wants us to do is to read together uh, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. So when we tried to read the lag, I think was unhelpful from last week. I'll just read it. And we just, just, just read along. I mean, just see it and read with me um, as, you, as you look at it. But Philippians 2, 5 through 11. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the proof of the pudding. Through his entire scriptural account, through his birth, life, death, and resurrection, through all of the Old Testament prophecies, through encountering Jesus ourselves in the church, in our own lives, and through the sacrament, this is the one that all will acknowledge and bow and obey, and praise, and know. Um, I think in my mind in that first section, a, a different translational wording about not counting the quality of God a thing to be grasped. That's what I'm most familiar with, but, but to his own advantage is a good one too. But you put these pieces together to count a quality with God, not something that he used to prove or make a point. It just simply was. Um, if you have to announce in a room with a loud voice and bang on the table, I'm the boss. <laughs> you are not the boss. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's an aphorism, but it's to say, if you have to overtly exert your authority and remind everybody in charge, you're actually not in charge. 
because somebody who's in charge wouldn't have to do that. Yep. Jesus is within the nature of God. This, this is the essence, but he doesn't have to use it, proclaim it in a way that says, well, you better do this or else. It simply is true. So, um, the, uh, the chapter itself starts talking about the differences in Christianity versus other, uh, say, philosophies. It mentions, you know, Marxism and Buddhism and these things mm -hmm. that um, the person espousing the initial philosophy and the philosophy are not one and the same. Meaning one can be a Marxist without Marx. You don't have to meet them. You don't have to know them. You can, you know, like some of the writings, you can apply some of the philosophy, whatever. The, the, the person and the philosophy can be separated out in the same way that uh, sometimes we've, maybe you've heard the phrase, separate the art from the artist. Mm -hmm. You ever seen a beautiful work of art and then you find out that the artist was like some, you know, psychotic, terrible person? You know, it, it kind of it puts a little, a little damper on your enthusiasm. Or, or you see a movie and you find out that the lead actor is like a really awful person. You know, whatever. But we separate the art from the artist in the sense of you can say what this person created, I can appreciate, even if I don't appreciate them, their personality, their choices in life, or whatever. You can't do that with Christianity. For the philosophy is a person. It's not just espousing ideas. It is Jesus revealing himself to us and being in a relationship with us. Now, there's a little linguistic point that I want to toss out. Um, and that is the term Christian. The etymology, meaning the study of the word origin, I think is worth noting at this point. We tend to assume that it means like a follower of Christ or one who believes in Christ or one who identifies with Christian doctrine or the example of Christ or whatever. Is that, is that a fair mm -hmm. statement? Yeah. Has anyone ever heard anything different about the origin of the term? I've heard it referred to as little Christ. That's exactly what it means. Etymologically, it doesn't mean follower of Christ. It means little Christ. So now I, I'm not saying that follower of Christ, disciple of Christ, and all those things cannot be wrapped into that understanding or even shouldn't be wrapped in that understanding. I'm just pointing out that the, the origin of the term was a, it originally was intended to convey that those disciples of Christ, those people who followed Jesus, who believed in Jesus, it's because they themselves either were or were trying to become little Christs. Hmm. To be like Jesus personally. Act like him, love like him, think like him. Now, and I just, I just think that's kind of a, it's a little nuance, but I think it's an important one. Um, and it's, and it reinforces why you can't separate the Christ from the Christianity. Uh, that, that's, that's kind of a famous statement from Gandhi. Um, I like their Christ. I don't like their Christian. Um, and that is a very fair critique that ought to be heard by the church to say when that is the case, that is not a failure of Christ or his church. That is a failure of us Christians because we are not acting like a little Christ. Right. Just like last week where we talked about the analogy from above and below with God the Father. Fatherhood is found in the essence of God and it is good and perfect and right. And when we human male parents don't live up to that, we are being less than fathers ought to be. Mm -hmm. So same thing about us as Christians to be a little Christ. And by little, I mean a diminutive, not like a little bit, 
but like a smaller <laughs> version. Or miniature, not a uh, miniature price. Right. Okay. Um, <coughs> so uh, let's get let's get back to the, the, those words in Jesus. Um, uh, the Greek Yesu. That's a translation. The Hebrew would be. He mentioned Yeshua. Yeshua. Yeah. Yeshua. Yeah. Now uh, he reminds us what what is what does Yeshua mean? What's the what kind of literal translation? God. God saves. Okay. Names are important, and names mean something. Uh, even today, new parents will pour over baby books, looking both for something that sounds good and something that means something. And sometimes they pick one or the other. It means something important, but it sounds terrible. Or I like the way it sounds, but it means something terrible. And it's just one of those things. But it was even more important in the past. When you named something, that name became a part of the understanding of identity. Um, you know, there's a joke that if you name, uh, if you name a little boy Bubba, he's not going to grow up into a quarterback. He's going to grow up into an offensive lineman. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so the names given make a difference, and that's just what parents picking them. Who picked the name of Jesus? God. The that's angel. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mary and Joseph didn't pick this one out of nowhere. The angel, the angel Gabriel informs yeah. them that you shall name him. This is God's very will being worked out. So the very identity from the beginning, God saves. Yes. The identity within his name is also his mission. It's his purpose. It is his essence. Now, it should throw no one off, but you'll occasionally come across the, the smart alecky. Oh, yeah, well, you know, dumb old Christians, and they don't know that really his name's just Josh. Uh, oh, okay, so Joshua in the Old Testament is the same, same name. name. Yeah. Same name. Um, why then is this translated Jesus and not Joshua? I think it's more about the confusion. They would have understood the distinction within their own language and culture better than we do, so we maintain the distinction. That they would pick up the nuance we don't. So it's a little more important for us to keep that separated out. Um, what else about the name of Jesus? And it's clearly important. We're, we're you know, we're going to get in a whole page worth of scripture references. The, yeah. the name of Jesus. You know, there is no other name under heaven given for salvation. Call upon the name of Jesus. Um, so the name itself has power, has importance, has significance, especially if that name is God saves. The anointed one who demonstrates and proves through his very life that God saves. Think of all the things you can unpack from two words, Jesus Christ. The anointed, the Messiah, the God saves, and think about it in terms of identity. Identity in a name, identity in a story, identity in a life, identity in action. Now, since the proof of the pudding is in the eating, if this guy named Yeshua didn't amount to a hill of beans, then this would not be the sort of name we would remember. Nor would it be the name, have, have there been other Jewish boys named Joshua or Yeshua before? Oh, sure, oh, yeah. but only one of them winds up with the title. <laughs> the Christ. The, the Messiah. Since I can remember, I think it's Ha Mishiach and... Oh, Christo, Christo, I don't know, whatever. Anyway, but that's, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. It's like you kind of, 
it's you ever you ever you ever meet somebody that you think is misnamed oh yeah <laughs> like uh yeah um you you know their name but you're like man what were your parents thinking or you 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 almost kind of picture them as something else um sitting here where i am i can catch out the corner of my eye this you know the, our, our sort of uh uh, we've got these clerk, all these clergy pictures. Mm -hmm. Kind of reminds me of the post office and wine posters. <laughs> um, but uh, but anyway, um, there in the bottom corner is a former deacon here from many years ago, and his name was Tex Norman. Uh -huh. And that is like, if you're named Tex Norman, how are you not a cowboy, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, my husband's favorite comic book in Italy, text. You know, it just, <laughs> but apparently he was a very gentle, spiritual oh. soul. He was a, a drama teacher and wrote poetry. But you hear that name and you think, you know, woohoo, buckaroo, and like he must be lasso and steers, right? And he spelled it T E X all in small. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I noted that. Um, so, Sometimes, though, you get somebody who's got a name and it just seems to fit perfectly, right? Yeah. Um, like, oh, you are definitely a so-and-so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you can name Jesus Jesus, but it only kind of makes sense after the fact. It only, it only seems proven as true after the fact. Just like the title gets associated after the fact. Whoever it is who is the Messiah, who is the anointed one, who is the Christ, well, that's the job description. And we see through your life, death, and resurrection. This man called God saves, proved it. Because through him, that life, death, resurrection, God saves. All right, so. Um, what, what else about the name Jesus Christ? I mean, we, we've only done two words so far, so we've got a ways to go. Anything else? All right. Can um, you spell how the connection I see is like Yahweh? Mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. with Yeshua? Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, my, I mean, I can spell, I can spell the tetragrammaton, yod hey bah hey, but I can't, I mean, Yeshua would be yod is shem, bah, no, no, wa, I don't know, I would have to look that up, I would say something wrong, and I'm on, I'm being recorded, okay. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I mean, there is that. You know that, that that's where the the the, the yet yeah part is. That's where it is referring to God, and the shua is referring to an action, and that's the, the salvation. Mm -hmm. um, but saying that it would be familiar to people that knew the Old Testament. Yeah, hundred percent. Make that bridge. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so let's go back to our let's go back to our creed for a second. Um, Uh, his only son, our Lord, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. So we've got to get to his only son. Now, there's a few bits of, about this that he points out are, are significant. What do you see? If we, if we Let's just say we've covered Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. So if that's the, the conclusion of this sentence, what do you note already about, about this uh this concluding phrase. What sticks out to you? His only. Oh. His only. Okay, so only means something. What if every word carries freight? Every single one of these words means something significant. Only is in there. Okay, so only stands out. What does McGrath tell us about only? One and only. One and only, right? There's that only implies uniqueness. Okay. But I thought we were all God's children. His own. Okay. He didn't have another one. Okay. So this is this will 
Um, this will imply, and we can infer, that's coming from both directions, a uniqueness to the sun shift that is related to, but distinct from our identity as sons and daughters of God, which the New Testament and even the Old Testament are as full of being God's children, being God's sons, and yet we are adopted into the family. And how are we adopted? Here's go. You cannot understand the life and ministry of Jesus outside of John's prologue in chapter one. It says so much in a single chapter. You know, the the uh, in the beginning was the word, the word was, 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 was with God, the word was God. Boom, there's a there's a divine nature, but already through that word, we are made sons and daughters, not by the will of our parents or of the will of flesh, but of the will of God. Through Jesus, God wills that we will be adopted into his family, and that is how it is accomplished. So in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a contemporary human family, you've got two ways that we basically recognize of having a son, okay? We would say by, um, by birth and by adoption. So by birth means, you know, naturally born with my genetic material and adopted means someone else's genetic material, but brought into the family and now made a permanent and full part of us. And we are brought in, not through our natures, but through God's nature. Not through our blood, but through his. And there's the distinction here. So we can be sons. As a matter of fact, he says, you know, through the the, um, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as a guarantee, we'll be counted as first sons, as oldest sons. Now, that's something talking about our inheritance in God's glory. But that, but we weren't there to start with. We have to be brought in. Um, Jesus starts there because he always is there, always was there. There has never been a time when he wasn't, I make that phrase very purposefully um, as a repudiation of the adoptionism that he references. Where is this? Uh, page. Oh, I don't know. Somewhere in there. He talks about adoptionism and docetism yeah, as being yeah. alternate. Uh, explanations of the nature of Jesus, mm. that Jesus was brought into sonship, perhaps at his baptism, perhaps at the, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Again, we can point back to John chapter one. There was never a time when the word was not with God or was God. There was never a time where Jesus is born, that his humanity has a starting point. But in his essence, he always is and was and ever shall be. So um, we are, I guess I should keep this up because I think it's kind of helpful to look at the actual verbiage. Um, so what else? His only son. We said only, there's a uniqueness. I think we've kind of talked about son. Um, there is an, I, there's an, a cultural identification in a son that means something different then than we do now. And just, just like linguistics and like connotation. So um, what's, what's, what's the distinction between son today and son in the first century, for instance. The son in the first century is the one who inherited everything from the father. 
and passed on that's right the name. the name the line the legacy the promise everything is coming through the, that first son um, and that's not to say that the second and third and fourth sons are cut out completely but that's up to the father but it is understood that the family finds its identity within the living father and in the next generation through the living son you are one in a line of a singular family that bloodline your name exists today in me as a father but in 20 years through my son just as fully as it was in me it is now his and we see this in a couple of ways not the least of which is um uh, parables that Jesus teaches, one about the, um, the tenants in the vineyard, mm -hmm. where the tenants stop tending things and they don't want to mm -hmm. send the crops back to the owner of the vineyard, and he has to send messengers, and they beat him up and rough him up, and so he sends his son, son. and he says, well, certainly they will respect my son. Why? Because when the son appeared, you were supposed to treat him identically as a, though the father were there. So what do they do? They say, oh, well, let's kill him. Because so if we kill him, him, we will inherit the property. <laughs> because of what we just mentioned, that the son is like the embodiment of the family in the same way the father does, because there's no other heir. So why did they kill him? Yeah, they assume, well, they assume that if the heir is eliminated, the family line stops. And if the family line stops, who has the next claim over the land? Those who occupy it. It's stupid. And it presupposes the father won't do something about it. <laughs> yeah. But, but that's what the, the understanding is. We eliminate the competition. Um, and in each of those family, it's still, that's the way it was with the Cassinis. But Angelo was the oldest son. Right. And he inherited the business and Italo's dad was second in line and it was never Angelo and Luigi. It was Angelo and then Luigi. Right. And that's, you know, it just, it is, you know, for, what in some is. ways it is what it is. And so whether or not we like it or whether or not society has changed, I want us reflecting on the, the purpose and the intent of what's being stated. So it's, and son makes a difference. What's something else you notice about son? I think this is worth saying and, and not, not for its most obvious reasons, but its second most obvious reason. Why son? Okay, this is this I is something that's been, like yeah. an analogy. A okay. son like the sun, warm and bright and everlasting and okay. <clears throat> sun keeps the family alive. Oh. Right. I, I think I think those are both uh, both really 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 helpful. In my mind, what we're going to we're going to talk to is related to the tail end, which he kind of goes over extremely quickly. Birth and born for somebody to be a son, you are a human person. The sonship because it's not just and it's not humanity in a generic sense. What is a son? Not just a human. What kind of human? A male. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking in terms of the, a hierarchy of, of man versus woman. What I'm saying is it's so specific because people are, we're born specific. We are born as this person and not a person. So by saying son, it's presupposing not just a generic humanity, but a specific individual person. Definitely. Like if you were to say my child, if I said my child said such and such the other day, which one of them said it? Yeah. <laughs> I've got five. <laughs> we need more but if I say my middle son, then I'm talking about Timmy. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's a specificity to it that I think is, mm -hmm. is, is worth noting. And that would be related then to the, the one last word that we haven't said a thing about, which is uh, his. Oh, this. His. Who's, who's he? The father. God the Father. God the Father. And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I bring that up again. This is not to have an argument about, you know, the masculine nature of God. It's just to say 
It's not a generic son. It is relationship at its heart and essence. Father to son. Which is ostensibly deeply important, close, and personal. Okay? Last two words of the sentence are also very profound. What are they? Our Lord. Our, Our and Lord. And I love the fact that he point he took the time to point out our because it's super important. Every word carries freight. Why? Why not? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, the Lord. That is a true statement. To say the Lord is a true statement. Why not say that? Because he's including all of us. He's he is including Lord. all of us. Here's the demand on us. Here is the response. To say he is the Lord, once again, even the demons believe and they shudder. It, we're not just making a statement of fact. He is the Lord. That's true. But beyond that, I believe he is my Lord. He is the Lord of me personally. He is the Lord as the head of the church. He is the Lord of all of creation of which I am a part. So even the owl, which seems like such a toss away, is super significant. Okay, so Lord, what, what, what's intended by Lord? Why is that an important word? We don't use it very often today in normal conversation. It shows his headship over all of us. Headship over all of us? In control, authority, power, responsibility. All of these things get wrapped up. Um, there's a, uh, I'm getting super obscure here and I apologize, but it's just because it's in my head. Um, a, a, a very interesting um, medieval poem. It's, it's, it's um, I think roughly the same timeline as something like Beowulf, but it's called The Wanderer. It's, an, it's old Anglo-Saxon. And it's basically talking about this, uh, this warrior knight kind of guy and his relationship with his feudal lord. And it's super intimate about, you know, my desires to serve you, to lay my head upon your lap, knowing that you're going to provide. And it's this really, really interesting portrayal that we, you know, like, you know, kings and knights and the lords and bosses and stuff. There was this sense of dependency when they said this. And it was intimate and it was profound. And that's not to say it was never misused or wrongly done or whatever, but it's to say at its heart, to have a Lord meant something so significantly profound to the person, something desired. And let me say, because nobody likes a boss, like to be, you know, you're not the boss of me, except when we do. We all want to be in charge until we don't. And it's a feeling of security and belonging. You better believe it. Because if you have a Lord, then you've got someone to watch over you. Right. And you need it. And everything else. Goes. And the buck's going to stop there, yeah. ultimately. Yeah. One of the things that, is, that I've, I've always thought about when this comes up is um, I never worried on a family vacation about how it was going to turn out. My dad had it. You know, I never worried where the money was coming from. I never worried if we were going to get lost. I never worried if the car was going to break down. All of those things could have happened. But as, as an adult, Lord only knows what my parents were going through with, uh, you know, how are we going to pay for this? Or how are we going to pay it off when the bills come due or whatever it was? Or trying to figure out, you know, did we turn the right direction or not? Uh, is the map wrong? Do we have a map? But as a you know, six or seven year old in the way back of the station wagon, I just kind of, it was my job to entertain myself and wait until we got to where we were going. And I never worried about the calamities of life that we could have always been an inch away from. Because my dad had this under control. 
And even if he didn't, you didn't know that. I didn't know that. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's comforting. Yeah. So there's an enormous amount of comfort that it was not on the responsibility on the shoulders of a six year old to make these things happen. In the same way our lives and in this world, all of creation, the universe, it's not on our shoulders to make it all happen and keep it going. We can't bear that sort of responsibility. The good news is we have a Lord. All right, anything else about the Lord? Okay, he brings up the Tetragrammaton, yeah. which uh, I've... I think we talked about the specifics in the past about where Jehovah comes from. Jehovah is kind of a nonsense word. It's, yeah. it's an inadvertent, incorrect translation. Yeah. The, um, when, you, when you write Hebrew, when adults write Hebrew, you don't put vowels in. The vowels are little points and dots and slashes. Um, a, a, a Hebrew you know, native speaker, natural reader, would see the way that it's written in the Old Testament and know that it didn't make it was that it was gibberish. It was purposeful gibberish. So they wouldn't inadvertently say something too holy for them to say. So they put in vowels that did not work. One of the few words where they would point the vowels. And the, and the vowels do not work. They make no sense because they're not the vowels that are associated with those consonants. They are the vowels from Adonai, Lord. And if you sound it out very slowly in your head, you can kind of see the vowels take their place. Adonai, take those sounds out and put them in the yod heh yo, you, you put it in there and you can start hearing the Yahweh or Jehovah or whatever, because they put in like this mental speed bump so people would stop before they said it. And they even gave you a helpful hint of what you can use instead of, oh, 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 I recognize that. Yeah. Those are the vowels for Adonai, Lord. That's safe to say. It's true because God is Lord and it's not inadvertently blasphemous. So I'll say that. Thanks. Oh, writer of that verse. So Adonai, Lord, the, the, the Tetragrammaton, the very name, an utterly holy name of God, and all put together, when we say that Christ is our Lord, we're also saying that Christ is the yeah. Lord, and it's all that Lord stuff wrapped together. Because note, even the capital L in Lord makes a difference. All sorts of lords in this world, just like there are all sorts of bosses, but there's only one with a capital. What else? All right, I will, I will um, just hit what he wraps up with pretty quickly, and I'll do it very quickly too. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. This is this neat transition from making a statement of both fact and identity, but it's kind of philosophical. It's kind of theological. I believe in Jesus Christ is the only son of our Lord. It's more an interpretive thing. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. Now that I've encountered Jesus in scriptures, in the church, and in my life, I affirm and attest to his identity. Well, then we kind of, go, we kind of back up just a little bit. And these next several sentences are going to be retelling the gospel story. The gospel story of the life of Christ, he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He, uh, uh, he actually takes maybe one paragraph to talk about this. And we could talk about just that one sentence all day long. What does it mean to be conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit? What's the mechanism that occurs when Gabriel tells Mary, you will be overshadowed by the power of the Holy Spirit and conceive a child? Ah, you know, what does it mean in, you know, genetically? 
Um, but the biggest thing, um, is this kind of double sided, double faceted, double natured way that this sentence is constructed? What, what do you think I mean by that? He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of Virgin Mary. What's, what's double about that? It's showing he's both divine and human. Right. There is, there is a divine nature, the power of the Holy Spirit. This is not a natural conception. This is a supernatural conception. From the very beginning, it is the power, it's the very nature of God that is present. That's one side. And what's the other side? He took on the Born man. of the Virgin Mary. Mary. Like a so, birth. yeah, like... I was born, you were born, I had a mother, you had a mother, all God's children got a mother. <laughs> that is, you know, we share our humanity with our mothers in a way that is unique. You know, we, we might take genetic material from our father, we might take traits, we might take legacy, we might take um, inheritance. Sense of humor. But for our mothers, oh, yeah. we lived inside of our mothers. We were nourished by, by our mothers. We were incapable of surviving without the direct action of our own mother's body. And so... There's that double balance there, the divine nature and the humanity and the mechanics of how we're not going to talk about right now because we've already had a good long class. But I mean, these are the things where you can read through the scripture references he's given. These are things where you can start thinking through stuff, reading back again through the earlier things he's written in this chapter and then applying them, what it means, because this is almost an expression of that divine nature and the human nature but just given so very, very simply. Every word having meaning, conception, power, spirit, born, virgin, and even a name. There are three names, like what we might consider human first names given in the entire creed. And Mary's one of them. Mm -hmm. um, without getting too deeply into the weeds on this, I just want to point out why on the three and what it means. What do we say Jesus means? We, we're identifying a person, this person, rather than anybody else in, in, in all of human history. But remember that name itself, God saves. Yeah. His mission and purpose, as well as his specific, unique identity. Mary, a real mother, just like you had. And even the fact that she's a Virgin Mary tells the story of the power of God and his divine nature and human nature. And then Pilate, Pontius Pilate. Pilate. And now this story is anchored at a real place, at a real time. Go look it up. It all happened. And it's three names. It's like you get the entire rationale and the background of the story. And everything else is just kind of adding amplifying details. The power of God, his humanity at a real time and place in history. What else? I really like the um, <clears throat> analogy the author gave about the two people, A and B, who couldn't get along. It's an intermediary, which is great stuff, right? Because we've never had a disagreement with somebody before <laughs> where we both felt like we were totally in the wrong and the other person was totally in the right. Or we, we were totally in the right. They were totally in the wrong. That's never happened to you, so I know this is a stretch. Uh. 
But have you ever been the intermediary for somebody else? Oh yeah. Sure. Yeah. Has anyone ever been an intermediary between you and someone else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it can make a big difference, can it? Yeah. Because sometimes you are just at a wall. The two of you are just at an, a total impasse. Between a rock and a hard place. And if you've been blessed with someone who can connect to you both. Yeah. It actually gives the hope of something happening where you've run out of ability to do anything about it. In a similar sense, you know, we can't save ourselves. We've run out of the ability to make our lives in this world right. Takes the intermediary. Um, this is in the incarnation. This is a stupid story. Um, when I was a brand new um, deacon and assistant working my first job in the church, one of my jobs was to point my finger during the Eucharistic prayer to the book so that the priest, as he's oh, reading the prayer, wouldn't yeah. get lost. <laughs> I did right? that too. So it was also my job to set the book because the altar book is a little more confusing than you might realize. We've got all those ribbons. If you've ever seen us with the mm -hmm. ribbons, yes. because it's got all these options and stuff. And if you don't have it set right, you flip pages and, and you, you have to stop the prayer and it's kind of a problem. You break prayer. everyone's concentration. So you're supposed to set it up in advance. I was getting ready to set up in advance for a Christmas service. And you get to the point, it's called the proper preface. And that's the portion of the prayer that's specific to the season of the church year. And for the life of me, I could not find Christmas. There's Epiphany. There's Pentecost. Um, there's Lent. Where the heck is Christmas? And I couldn't find it. Like, okay, okay, okay. Maybe it's like a technical thing. Maybe like a nativity. Nothing. Because you know what it's called? Incarnation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks for nothing. I got in trouble because I did not put two and two together and I had the ribbon in the wrong place. The proper liturgical term for Christmas is actually the Feast of the, the Incarnation. incarnation. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And Incarnation itself means enfleshment in meat meant. Like, if you've had chili con carne, that's chili with meat. When Jesus took on meat, when God became mass. From this moment on, and this is why Christmas is like this dividing point in all of human history and what has uh, its own season and stuff and why, well, nothing else super important happens other than the birth, like he's not done on the cross or anything. From this moment on and for all eternity, God has flesh. The, Unbelievable. The son, the second person of Trinity is pre-existent. But it is at, and the argument could easily be at the Annunciation, the conception. Fine, you got me. There's a reason. <laughs> There's a reason that we celebrate the, the Annunciation on a particular day. Anybody know the, the Feast of the Annunciation on the church calendar? December. March 25th. March 25th. Really? And what's March 25th? Nine months before December 25th. Nine months before December 25th and the historic date within the church of Good Friday. Mm -hmm. For the full and completeness in the life of Christ, in his perfection to be conceived on the date in which he will die. March 25th, March 25th. Mm -hmm. Now, whether it was exactly March 25th or not, but that's what the church understood. Those who were there and remembered said, well, that's the date. So we just kind of take it on, on faith there. So the December 8th is the Feast of Mary. Yeah, like the Immaculate Conception is a Mary issue, not a Jesus issue. Okay. It's, it's, it's backwards. It's kind of by, by, it's derived, it's derivative. But, but yeah, the, um, so the Annunciation, we get this 
kind of weird Christmassy story way deep in Lent where it almost seems out, seems out of place unless, unless he is fully divine, he is fully man, and in his flesh, even from the beginning, God's purpose is being worked out that God saves through this very flesh. Okay, that's 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 plenty, right? Are we good? Yeah. Anything else? Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you guys. I appreciate it. And we will get some more. Um, we will get some more next Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you, Karen and Janet.